Okay, why don't we get uh, started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor Sanjeev Goyal uh, from Cambridge for our uh, uh, last uh, IDSS Distinguished Seminar of the semester. Uh, Sanjeev is the chair of the Faculty of Economics at uh, Cambridge University. Uh, he was the founding director of the uh, uh, INET Institute, Institute for the New Economic Thinking. Uh, he is one of the pioneers of uh, uh, bringing tools from network science into economics. Uh, his work on network formation and uh, learning in uh, uh, starting from 90s is uh, very well cited and it's a great pleasure to have him here. Uh, also, uh, we have a personal connection. Uh, he hosted me for a month when I was on sabbatical uh, four years ago. So it's a great pleasure to have you here and we're looking forward to your talk on uh, conflict in networks. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, likewise, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, um, I was just telling Ali that I could easily spend uh, a week meeting people and um, catching up and discussing ideas and so I'm, uh, I'm somewhat embarrassed I'm having to fly back tomorrow. Um, but very pleased to be here. And uh, uh, this is um, a work in progress. Um, and I thought it would be a good um, uh, project to, to discuss, to present to this audience, because it, um, I think it illustrates um, in a very simple way and how you can use network ideas uh, to uh, you know, build models which are very uh, simple, I hope you will, you will agree when you see the model that I'll present. It's going to be a mathematical model uh, of conflict and um, you'll see that it'll be very simple. Uh, but I think I'll try and persuade you that you can address some very big questions in history and uh, in international relations, some rather first order questions that people have thought about for a very long time using uh, a very general but very simple uh, mathematical model. So it's, uh, um, it's, a, it's, an, it's an illustration of how uh, you can use network models to address uh, very applied sort of problems, uh, long, long standing problems uh, and puzzles, if you like. So, um, so the background to this project, I should say, I should start with a personal note. Many years ago, uh, I was playing the board game of Risk with my older son. I don't know how many of you have played the board game of Risk. I think many of you have played it, and I guess now people don't play the board game, they play, play it online. So, but this is a game in which um, every player has some, uh, you know, is, is ruling a kingdom or a country, and they have, the country has an army, and you can use the army to conquer neighboring kingdoms or neighboring countries. And then the goal is to conquer as much of the world as you can, and in principle, to eliminate everyone else and you know, conquer the world. Okay, but so, so that's the board game, and many of you have experience with this. And as I said, I think there are more sophisticated versions of this online now. Um, so the background to this model really goes back to uh, playing this game, and I, it occurred to me then that one could think about this problem um, as a mathematical problem of how would you, um, you know, uh, what sort of a strategy should you use if you were happy, you were a player in this game, um, uh, you know, who, who should you attack? And the only thing that's going to happen here, which is different from the board game of risk, is that um, you can remain peaceful. Okay, so this is going to be an important part of the project and important part of the talk today that unlike in the board game of risk, you may actually decide that the best thing for you is to remain uh, peaceful and for everyone to remain peaceful. Okay, but, but other than that, uh, the idea of, of this, pro this project, this model really came to me uh, many years ago, uh, maybe 10 years ago when I was playing this game and I said, well, you want to have neighborhoods, you want to have a ruler, who wants to attack neighboring rulers, well, then you should think of some links, and then you can attack a neighbor, capture the neighbor, and then capture the neighbor of the neighbor, and that suggested naturally uh, setting with a network structure. 
Okay, so, so that's sort of by way of background, sort of personal history. Uh, and then over time, I've been working with Marcin Dobzinski uh, on models of conflict. Uh, he's a computer scientist in, in Warsaw, and David Menashe is a former PhD student of mine in, in Cambridge. So as I said, this is the framework. Um, there's going to be a collection of kingdoms. Every kingdom has a resource, some resources, and a ruler. Rulers seek to maximize resources. So they want to control as much resources as, they, as, as possible. So that's the goal. And what the ruler can do is uh, the ruler can look around, and maybe all his neighbors are very powerful, and he's scared of losing to them, so he decides not to fight. Or he can attack some neighbors and then capture them and have more resources and then carry on. Okay. Uh, an important element of the uh, talk today is going to be what happens when I attack a neighbor. Well, the outcome of that war or the battle is going to depend on the resources I allocate and, uh, and also the resources the opponent allocates. And uh, it's also going to depend on the technology of, of conflict. Okay, so that's going to be an important variable in this problem. Um, the winning ruler expands his domain and may attack new neighbors, as I said. So the key question here is, uh, how does, how does do these three things, resources of the kingdoms, the technology of conflict and the network uh, structure, who's a neighbor of whom, how uh, do these three things affect the dynamics of war? Okay, so, uh, and in fact, the title of the paper that underlies this talk is the conquest, the strategy of conquest. So how would you go about um, attacking, you know, which do you attack people? If so, which neighbor do you attack? And then which neighbor do you attack after that? Do you stop after some time? And, you know, what does it mean for uh, the dynamics of war? Um, so that's the sort of mathematical structure. And the, the paper, uh, we, I'll discuss at length, actually, that the dynamics of war and hegemony, uh, this is going to be a game model, and so there will be look, we will be looking at equilibrium behavior of rulers. Uh, and I'm going to argue that thinking through this model is uh, a very, helps, offers us a very nice way of thinking about major developments in world history. So I'll show you many applications, many sort of specific sort of contexts, many specific development in world history to illustrate that. Uh, I won't talk about the second uh, uh, sort of application of this model, and that is to competing theories in international relations. Um, and and I'll, I'm happy to do it offline, uh, but you know I have an R, and it, we probably won't get to that. So, so just by way of background, so this is going to be uh, a model where let me show you a picture to get you to think about how this is going to work out. So we are going to have a model where there are nodes, there are kingdoms, which are represented by nodes. And so in this picture on the left, you have uh, eight nodes. So there are eight kingdoms. Uh, but what you see here is that over time, some of these kingdoms have fought with each other. And they are no longer, now they have shared colors, which reflects if you like, empires. So you have a green empire, and then you have this orange empire, and uh, you have blue and, and yellow and red kingdoms. So the numbers within those nodes are the resources okay, that these nodes have. And what happens when you go from the left picture to the right picture is an instance of um, the dynamics here. So the orange empire fights the blue kingdom, and the blue kingdom defeats the orange empire, and so the blue kingdom takes over. Okay, so this is the simplest case where if um, one ruler fights another ruler and there is an outcome, uh, then the victor takes over, uh, so the, the, the loser is eliminated, and the winning ruler takes over the losing kingdom. So that's the simplest setting. Okay, it, it's easy to see you could have a smoother, more gradual model where blue defeats orange. In the first instance, blue captures the first node, first bit of the empire, and then fights uh, the remaining uh, bit of the kingdom and then takes over the second node as well. Okay, so, but 
but, but that's sort of the idea that in the simple setting, this is how the dynamics are going to go. Um, and so what's going to happen here is that you have an underlying network which is reflected in the um, uh, which is reflected in the so it's actually not um, easy to see uh, it's not the resolution is not very good but there are actually uh, I have the the dark uh, the dark links between the nodes are the links across the kingdoms okay and there are of course links within an empire uh, for instance there are links between the two green nodes, five and nine, but it's not easy to see that in the picture. But it's there, it's sort of very, very uh, blurred. Uh, but what we see here is, um, you know, that the, uh, the, some of these links are missing, but really what I would like you to take away from this is the, neighbor, the neighborhood relations between the rulers, you have when I was describing uh, uh, at the start the, the fight between the blue and the orange kingdoms, you have a dark link, which is a link across kingdoms. And uh, that, you can see on the right-hand side, it doesn't, you can't see it, but really um, it's sort of missing, but that's sort of the underlying network. Now, this network can reflect many things, and a simple interpretation of the network is physical contiguity, right? So if you have a physical neighbor, you know, you're physically adjacent to another country, that's a simple way of thinking about links. But the notion of links is very general. So it could be that, um, you know, I have flown in from England, and if you have a navy, you can come across, right, and, and attack uh, another country or can try and control another country. So the links here, actually will reflect, if you like, the state of technology, the state of access relations. Uh, in this simple setting, um, they are undirected. That's the other thing. In, in actual practice, it may well be that blue can access orange because it has a navy, but orange cannot access blue because it doesn't have a navy. Okay, so I think those kinds of uh, considerations can be naturally you know, introduced into this model. Five and nine are all fully connected or not necessary? Um, so, so I can tell you because I can see it on the screen here. Uh, so three and five are connected and five and nine are connected. They don't all have to be connected. It doesn't have to be a clique. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry about the resolution. It's, it's actually quite clear here in the picture here, but I think it's missing. Okay. Okay. So, so that's sort of the broad... Uh, setting and this, these slides are just, you know, being a little formal about it. There are n rulers. There are some vertices. Um, every vertex has a resource endowment, which is R V, and the there is an ownership uh, function which maps the vertices into the set of owners, the rulers, and so uh, the resources a ruler I has an ownership state O is simply the sum of resources of uh, all the uh, vertices that it controls. Okay. And uh, I've already talked about neighbors. So two rulers are neighbors if they control vertices which are, uh, have a link in the underlying network. So, so that's sort of the basic setting. The other ingredient is the technology of war or the conflict model of conflict. And we have a fairly general model of conflict. So if um, a ruler puts in x1, another ruler puts in x2, what's the probability that uh, ruler 1 wins? And what's the probability that ruler 2 wins? That's captured. Uh, that idea, you know, what's the uh, model that sort of reflects that, is captured on the slide. And we are using a classical uh, sort of framework. Uh, this draws on the work of Scaperdas. Uh, there are some axioms that we require uh, that this is a probability, that it's symmetric, and if ruler one puts in more resources, the probability of him winning should increase. 
Whereas if his opponent puts in more resources, the probability of him winning should decrease. Okay, with those three axioms, you get a very simple formulation. Uh, the probability of x winning against y is given by this function, um, f of x divided by f of x plus f of y, where f is an increasing and positive function. Okay, so it's a very simple formulation. And um, what I'm going to do is, uh, in the talk, I'll use this example of f. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm going to use um, f of x is um, x raised to the power gamma. Okay, so this is the, um, I'm using the particular example where f of x is x raised to the power gamma, where gamma is some um, non-negative number. So, so a couple of remarks. So I haven't talked about this explicitly yet, but you can see that when rulers fight with each other and they assign, they allocate very limited resources to fighting, then of course it may well be that you will have a tie. Okay, so, so it's fairly easy to accommodate the possibility of a tie in this model. Uh, and finally, um, I haven't talked much about this guns versus butter. Yes? Alliances later? Uh, I'm not going to actually get to alliances, but, uh, but I, we can talk about alliances. I'm not going to have any results on alliances in the talk today, uh, but that's obviously an important element here. Uh, but you'll see this, uh, you know, as I get into this, you'll see there's a lot of stuff going on with these rulers acting independently. But uh, once I present some of the results, we can then maybe discuss alliances. Uh, so, so that's sort of the uh, third ingredient, okay? Uh, and now we are at a point where I can go through the formal description of the game. What are the actions that people choose, the rulers choose? So this is going to be a dynamic game. It's taking place in discrete time. Uh, people come in, uh, you know, tease, this is a discrete time uh, notation. And what's happening here is um, in each period, a ruler is picked. Uh, if he wants to fight, he goes ahead and picks a neighbor to fight. If he doesn't want to fight, uh, then another ruler is picked, and so forth. If all rulers choose peace, the game ends. If the ruler fights and loses, the round ends, and if he wins, he can continue fighting if he wants to continue you know, fighting more neighbors. Okay. So you can see that in any round, either the game would end, or the number of rulers is going to um, is going to fall by at least one. Therefore, there must be at least, at most, n minus one rounds in this game. Okay, okay so, so, uh, this is just formalizing the attack sequence. So what's an attack sequence? An attack sequence for a ruler, given an ownership state, O, is simply telling him who he should attack, maybe he doesn't want to attack anyone, or if he's going to attack, what's the order in which he should attack you know, rulers, if he's going to win? That's the attack sequence. Um, and so I'm going to denote um, history as the ownership state and the sequence of rulers that have been picked in that you know, so far, and, uh, and I'm going to have this simple bit of notation. I'll denote by capital H a set of all possible histories and a strategy is simply a mapping from the set of histories to the set of people he can attack, the attack sequence. Okay, so, so here's an example of an attack sequence. This is a very famous um, episode from, this is the start of the Second World War. And so here you have, um, you know, this is, the, this is at the very start in 1938. And I'm just going to show you, you know, a particular attack sequence. This is uh, taking, this is Hitler, Germany taking over Czech Republic, Czech, Czechoslovakia, and then bits of Poland, and then Denmark, Norway, uh, Netherlands, Belgium, uh, France, and Southern Europe. So this is an example of an attack sequence. You attack, you know, neighbor by neighbor, if you like. Um, and so, 
So as I said, starting at any history, you have a strategy profile, uh, depending on who's asked to move. And given that this is a finite game, I can write down the distribution on the final ownership states, OK, with this piece of notation. And so the expected payoff to player i, given the ownership state O, uh, under the strategy S is given by this equation. This is simply saying, what's the probability of ownership state O prime? And what are my resources in this ownership state? So every ruler seeks to maximize her expected payoff. Uh, this is this expression here. Uh, this is the finite game of perfect information. So we study subgame perfect equilibrium. Equilibrium exists and is unique. So I'm just going to uh, take this as background and look at what the equilibrium looks like. So, uh, so the way this model works is we are going to look for the strategy sequence that players have. And remember, we want to understand when players want to fight, how is that related to their resources and the technology and the network. And uh, we want to understand, um, in particular, whether they would want to fight till the finish or they would want to fight partially and then stop. Okay, so the first thing we do is we define these um, so remember, I had put up, um, you know, this technology function, um, and I'm going to use this for the rest of the talk. Uh, the paper itself has a much more general formulation of conflict, but for the purposes of the talk, I think it's just simpler to focus on this uh, parameter gamma. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I'll talk, of, you know, there'll be quite a bit of discussion about this technology uh, parameter. So. Here's a simple observation. Um, if I just think about two rulers and I ask whether they have an incentive to fight each other, um, the answer is, is sort of given by this uh, slide. It's saying that if gamma is greater than one, uh, then the rich guy gains by fighting the poor ruler. And if gamma is less than one, it's the poor ruler who gains by fighting the rich ruler. Uh, so that leads me to define the gamma greater than one case as rich rewarding and the gamma less than one case as poor rewarding. Um, and so now you can see that generically um, in any situation where the gamma is smaller or, or, or greater than one, generically, if you take two rulers, one of them would want to fight the other. So the only reason there may be peace in this world is because people are far-sighted, because they worry if they fight, there may be more fights, and that may be bad for them. So, so that's sort of worth bearing in mind. So now, having got the rich rewarding, poor rewarding definition, um, you know, we have that at the back of my mind. We are going to address two questions. The, this, the theorem, this theorem addresses two simple questions. The first question is, um, if I know that I have, let's say I know I have two neighbors and they are going to fight each other, should I fight them now before they have fought each other? Should I fight them in sequence? Or should I wait for them to have fought, become one large empire, and then fight them? Okay. So the first part of the theorem answers that question, and it's really a timing of attack. Should I attack now, or should I wait and attack later? And the answer is, if gamma is greater than one, I have a no waiting property. I want to attack them sequentially while they are still small. If gamma is greater than one, I prefer to wait. I'd rather wait, let them fight each other, become huge, and then I would want to fight them. Okay. So what's the intuition here? Um, the intuition here is, suppose gamma is zero. So when gamma is zero, it means that the resources x and y don't matter you know, the probability of winning is half, irrespective of the resources. But if that is the case, if I were to fight the two sequentially, the probability I'm going to beat them both is one quarter, because it doesn't depend on the resources. Whereas if I waited and they fought each other and I fought them, the probability of me winning would be one half. So that's sort of the very simple sort of intuition, I'd rather wait. On the other hand, if gamma is very large, well, if the two fight, they may be too big for me. There would be no hope for me at all. So I definitely want to fight them when they are small. Okay. 
Okay, so that's sort of the very simple intuition for the first part of the result, which is a waiting versus no, no waiting property. Okay, so, um, and, and you can see that this is beginning to provide us a foundation for preemptive war, right? Because if you are in the gamma greater than one situation, you may want to attack. Even if you are small, you may want to attack a big guy because if you didn't, he would become even larger. Okay, so this is sort of, that's sort of the idea here. So the second part of the theorem is about the order of attack. So I have two neighbors, y and z. Y is smaller than z. The question is, should I attack y first and then z, or should I attack z and then y? Okay, so, so that's, uh, and the answer is, again, it turns on the value of gamma, and it says that if gamma is greater than one, I go and I, I attack uh, the smaller ruler first and then the bigger ruler, whereas if gamma is smaller than one, I attack the bigger ruler first and then the smaller ruler. So that's the order of attack uh, result. Okay. So, so once we have this sort of very simple incentives to fight and who you want to fight, when you want to fight, uh, and you know, we have this equipment, we can now locate this in a network setting. Okay. So, so this is the uh, theorem that I'll, I'll spend quite a bit of time uh, sort of talking through the proof, but then illustrating the ideas of this theorem. So what is this theorem saying? Um, this is a theorem. Um, it's basically looking at the case where I have a connected graph Okay, so if I don't have a connected world, I can look at each component and the theorem would apply. I have a generic resource profile, um, you know, so everyone has positive resources. Uh, suppose that the technology is rich rewarding. So in equilibrium, we have the following properties. First of all, if there are three or more rulers active, then everyone would want to fight everyone. In, in other words, if anyone is picked, uh, the ruler would attack one of the neighbors. Okay. Uh, so this is more or less saying that, that, that this is a world which is, um, which, character, which is characterized by incessant warfare. No matter who is asked, they want to fight their neighbor. But of course, it, that means as long as there are three guys, they always want to fight, so you will eventually get to two rulers. And if you have only two rulers, we know uh, that one of them would definitely want to fight the other. The rich will always want to fight the poor. And so you must get hegemony in equilibrium. In every equilibrium, you will get hegemony. There will be eventually one guy who, is the, uh, who, who controls everything. Okay. So, and finally, the equilibrium is unique, so it's not surprising that the probability of becoming a hegemon is unique. Okay, so, so that's sort of pinned down by the parameters of the model. So, so that's sort of the, uh, so what are the ideas that go into proving this result? Um, so the first thing is this definition. Of, it's a very simple idea. So I would say a ruler is strong if uh, the ruler has an attack sequence uh, such that at every point in the attack sequence, he's fighting a weaker, a poorer ruler. Okay, so he's, um, and so we want to kind of, we're going to use this idea of a strong ruler in doing the, in, 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 in proving the result. Okay. So the first step is to show there exists a strong ruler. So why is there always a strong ruler in any state of the system? Well, take the ruler with the largest resources. So all his neighbors are poorer than him by definition. If he fights one of them, he will become even richer. So uh, it follows that all the neighbors he will then have will also be poorer than him, and so forth. Okay, so there is always a strong ruler in every state of the system. Uh, now, if you take a strong ruler, notice that in a rich rewarding setting, by definition, when a rich guy fights a poorer ruler, in expected terms, he becomes richer when he fights. That's the definition of rich rewarding. Okay, so, so if everyone is peaceful, the strong ruler has a, has a clear incentive to fight till the finish. He gains every point every time he fights. That's just a consequence of the rich rewarding um, notion. So if everyone else is peaceful, the strong ruler wants to fight. But of course, it may be 
that a strong ruler uh, might want to wait because others want to fight. But we know from the no-waiting property that if others are going to fight, then it's even more in my interest to fight now rather than wait because I'm disadvantaged if others get fight and become larger. So that reinforces the first step, and it says that a strong ruler actually has more or less a dominant strategy of fighting till the finish. Okay. So, yep. Is there no friction in the fight, meaning that I don't lose resources if I'm the winner? Right, so in, this, in the setting so far, when I fight, uh, if I win, I basically get the sum total of our, your resources and my resources. No there is no friction. Okay, I'm going to come to friction in a moment here, but at the moment there is no friction. Okay, so so this is all being driven essentially by this, if you like, uh, this rich rewarding property. Okay, so. Um, and the final step here is to look at poor rulers. And now notice that a poor ruler knows that if he fights a rich neighbor, he's got very poor, very, you know, he's likely to lose. So that doesn't sound like good, I, it doesn't sound like a very good idea to fight a rich ruler neighbor. But the poor ruler knows that it's only a matter of time before a strong ruler is going to come and get him. And by the time the strong ruler gets him, the strong ruler would have become very large. And so it's better to attack now so this is essentially the preventive or the preemptive war argument. So you know that things are going to really get bad. Your chances are not good, but they would actually get even worse if you waited. So you want to fight now rather than wait. Okay, so that's sort of the uh, final step of the proof. Okay. So just to uh, remind you, this is the theorem. Um, it's saying that everyone wants to fight at every step. Um, and in particular, there is, so therefore, you know, people will fight and there will be hegemony. Um, and it's, you know, the probability of being a hegemon is unique given the parameters gamma, r, and the network g. Okay. So, so that's sort of, um, you know, the, the, the theorem. And let me just try and um, bring out four observations. Uh, so what's happening in this model uh, and what the theorem says is that you're going to have wars. Sometimes the winner, the, 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 they will, they may be, you know, the, the person who's attacking might lose, in which case there may be a temporary pause. Someone else might be then picked and might expand for a bit. And so, you know, you will have quite a lot of uh, dynamics in this, in the equilibrium. Uh, there's nothing deterministic, so it's not clear who's going to be winning. In fact, Every ruler has a positive probability of being the hegemon. So there's a lot of richness here. Uh, but the expansion of a kingdom and will be through contiguous expansion, right? So the kingdom will expand by attacking neighbors, and bit by bit it will expand and fill up the network. So that's one feature of the dynamics of this model. Um, the other f aspect of, this, uh, of, the, of the theorem is the dynamics are contingent on the capacity for war, and, and I'm going to elaborate on that when I talk about history in a moment, but essentially, uh, the more resources I have, um, the more likely it is that I'm going to be able to take over, but also the more resources I have relative to my neighbors, that's going to matter. It's not important you know, whether I'm rich or poor, it's very important that my neighborhood is poor relative to me. That gives me really an advantage to expand. So that's going to be uh, you know, key in, in the way the dynamics are going to play out. Um, the third thing is that the way the dynamics are going to play out will depend on the connections. And so if networks change, let's say because of the growth of the Navy or because of the growth of new technologies, uh, like virtual technologies uh, that we see in the modern world where you have network-based conflict, then you can have very different kinds of contiguity you know, network and therefore very different kinds of dynamics. Okay, and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, finally, we have the, this idea that even small guys want to fight because they really fear that if they didn't fight now, they would lose out. So that's the idea of preventive and pre preemptive war. So, so here's a first example of contiguous expansion 
Um, this is over 200 years, uh, the period of 500 to 272 BC. And so what I'm doing is I'm just showing you how um, you take uh, Rome, early Rome, early Roman Republic, and you can map this into the network, and I just walk you through the expansion of Rome over a 200-year period, 200 year period. So this is, you can see it's contiguous, and uh, the final step is Rome develops a navy, and now it can actually go and take over islands. So in fact, the network has almost changed slightly, and it allows Rome to take over the, these islands. Um, that's one example, very simple illustration of contiguous expansion of an empire. Um, a second example here is what happens when one kingdom um, in a network, when it suddenly acquires a lot more resources. Okay, so this is a setting which is very famous. It's a, it's a celebrated moment in world history when um, early Chinese kingdoms, which were fighting for several hundred years, um, suddenly there was a kingdom that came, came up from the periphery, in fact, and took over the rest of the country. And this all happened actually within roughly 50 years uh, from um, about 100 years, from 320 BC to 220 BC. And what's really going on here is there's been fighting going on for hundreds of years. No kingdom has dominated this, um, this part of the world. But one kingdom now suddenly expands its army, expands its resources through major reforms in the state. And as a result, it's able to now defeat all the neighboring kingdoms. Okay, so this is um, the key thing here is the incredible increase in the capacity of one of the kingdoms. And, and so now you don't have ties when they fight and you have very rapid takeover. Um, so here's a, a one consequence, for instance, was for hundreds of years, the size of the army was about 50,000 soldiers or less. But by the third century BC, uh, the big armies were over 600,000 soldiers. So there was a massive expansion in the size of the standing army. Um, and so what you see here, this is an illustration of uh, the dynamics in this period. Uh, you, you see that there is to and fro, uh, they're expanding, they are around. Um, uh, but then now when you reach 249, you see that the dynamics really speed up. And this Qin dynasty, uh, you know, is just running over the others um, in really less than 50 years. Um, so that's an example of how the, what I didn't do in the model formally was I didn't really have um, uh, the, the contest function uh, was essentially, you know, you were winning or losing. But when you have very limited resources, when you fight, in fact, you have stalemate. You have a lot of ties, you have draws, and nothing much happens. Territory exchanges hands. It doesn't really go over. The kingdoms are not somehow conquered. Okay, but what, that's what happened uh, with the expansion and the scale of the Qin kingdom. Uh, the last um, illustration is really what happens when networks change. And uh, the key here is the period um, around 1500 AD when uh, the army uh, and the navy and uh, really uh, developed very rapidly in, in Western Europe. And uh, that and, and the development of cannon and gunpowder completely changed the military technology uh, underlying European states. So as a result, the network um, I'm going to show you an illustration of what happened. Uh, this is um, the situation in 1479 before uh, Columbus uh, arrived in America. And you see uh, there are the Aztecs and the Incas, and uh, Spain itself is divided. Uh, but by 1500, Spain is united. Uh, and actually, you can see that they have captured the Caribbean and the Aztecs are still around, and, and the Incas are around. But by 1540, you see this major change. But what's really going on here is you see these new links being created across the sea, which is really a new link through the Navy and, and the, uh, 
the new military, that the military technology with which the Spaniards arrived in, in the Caribbean. Um, and so you see that now you see a combination of physical contiguity and the Navy uh, shaping the growth of the Spanish and the Portuguese empire. So, um, and so this is a illustration of how changing in the changes in the network have led to you know, the growth of global empires along with changes in the military technology in Europe. So this is the, the final um, implication of the theorem that you have an incentive for preemptive war. Uh, and this is a, there's a typo there. This is a very well-known uh, book by Michael Walzer, who is a political philosopher. And uh, I think the book is called Justified War. Uh, and this is the defense for preemptive war. Uh, and, you know, you, you can have a preemptive war when you have these sorts of our considerations, which is exactly what the theorem tells us is a rationale for small, poor uh, rulers attacking um, other rulers in this uh, in, in equilibrium. So uh, there are many well-known examples for preventive war, and I've given two, the Peloponnesian War and, and German occupation of Netherlands, but essentially uh, this is the idea that you, you act in anticipation of bad things happening and are trying to avoid them. So how am I doing? How am I doing for time? 15 minutes, okay. So, so what I'll be doing in the uh, rest of the talk is I'm gonna try and develop a little more uh, formally the idea about how resources and networks affect the probability of becoming the hegemon. So remember, in this setting, theorem one tells us, in any equilibrium, you will have a hegemon. And so the question is, how do the resources and the networks affect the probability of being that hegemon? So, so by way of, uh, so to get some idea about what is involved here, let me show you a picture. So this is a picture where you have I think 13 kingdoms, and they have these resources, okay, uh, and there's a network, and then there are these resources. And what I've done here is um, I have tried to give you a sense of um, who are the rulers who are going to be, um, you know, who are strong. They are in red, okay. So why is Mr. Eight strong? Well, Mr. Eight is strong because he can, you know, attack six, um, who is weaker than him, attack two, possibly attack four, and then attack one, and then, you know, he will become quite large. He can then attack nine, and so forth. So he's actually quite small. Uh, he's quite poor, but, but, you know, he has neighbors who are even poorer than him, and so he can construct a sequence of attacks such that at the end, he will have, you know, he will have more than 36 units, and so he can actually uh, defeat, 30, you know, he can defeat this red node. Um, so on the other hand, there is this, um, you know, there is this um, kingdom with 17 units, which is actually much richer than this kingdom with eight units. In fact, it's more than twice as rich. Uh, nevertheless, it, um, it's, it's, it's in yellow, which means it's not a strong ruler. Uh, why is that? Because even if 17 were to defeat 16, he would still have only 33 units, which is not enough for him to, to defeat 34, 36, for sure. Uh, you know, he doesn't have a strong sequence. Okay. And, and finally, you have these three guys here. And if you look at them, you see that four has two and one who are poorer than him, and he can defeat them. But notice that even if four defeats one and two, he will still only have seven units, and that's less than the units that all his neighbors have, 9, 11, 15, 10, 34, 36, and 8. So, so what I want to do is um, uh, draw your attention to the idea that when I take this gamma parameter to be very large, then if a ruler fights another ruler, what matters is who's richer. That's going to be decisive. Distinguish between uh, 
militarily uh, rich and resource rich. For example, Japan attacked Indonesia. Indonesia is rich in oil, but not in, not in military strength. Yes, so, uh, so that's one of the, so, so I, I was going to say a few words on the notion of resources in this setting. Uh, so let me, this is a good moment to talk about it. So what I'm really doing here is I'm conflating different kinds of resources. So it could be, you know, oil resources, it could be mineral resources, it could be even, you know, production capacity and army capacity. Um, I'm not actually distinguishing them. I'm not making a fine sort of distinction between these things. And it's all sort of put together. Uh, and also, I'm not separating the resources devoted to the army versus the resources devoted to production, for example, the guns versus butter trade-off. So it's all sort of being you know, uh, simplified, if you like. So a lot of what I'm saying here, um, you can rewrite in terms of the following kind of model, where countries choose how much to allocate to fighting and how much to, and there's a cost to fighting. Uh, and, but as long as the cost to fighting is somehow related to the resource base or the wealth of the country, then many of the things I'm saying here would carry over. In particular, if the cost to me of fighting, the marginal cost to me of fighting is lower, the more resource rich I am, the richer I am. Then what will happen is that in any contest between a rich and a poor kingdom, the richer kingdom will allocate more resources to fighting because the marginal costs are lower. And, and, and therefore, in this sort of world of technology, this contest function, they will essentially have more resources um, directed to fighting compared to the poor kingdom. And that will uh, generate the kind of dynamics that, that I've been discussing. Okay. But of course, the point you're making is probably slightly different. So Indonesia may want to allocate a lot of resources, but it doesn't have the technology to make use of the resources. Um, so if you go back to my technology formulation, you know, I had this uh, model where, I'm going back far too, too much, but um, you know, I had this model where I wrote down um, out here. So in this setting, uh, an axiom that Scapedas has a symmetry. Uh, that leads me to this formulation. But I think the story of Indonesia and Japan would be more, uh, you know, better captured in a model where um, the Fs are different. So, you know, uh, you know, it may be that Japan allocates X, Indonesia allocates Y, but its military technology is, is much weaker. So the function here is not F, but it's maybe G of Y. And that will reflect, you know, the uh, differences in technology between the different kingdoms. Uh, so I haven't, uh, we haven't developed it uh, fully, but that would be the way to accommodate the kind of point you are making. So, so let me, maybe it's better to. So what the slide does is it just formalizes the uh, point that of the picture, uh, and in particular, the, the one thing I want you to sort of take away from the slide is the notion of a boundary of a set of nodes U. It's simply the nodes that are you know, circling the set U. Okay. And uh, in this picture, uh, so I'm going to say that a certain set of vertices U is weak if uh, you know, this uh, the subgraph containing U, you know, is connected. Uh, the boundary is not empty, and for every vertex in the boundary, the resources are larger than the sum total of resources in the set U. Okay, so you can see that here. This is a weak set because every node connected. This is the boundary, um, and you see that every node in the boundary has more resources than, uh, you know, than seven units. So this is a weak set, uh, and, and this is weak uh, because it has two, you know, 
it's a singleton weak set, and likewise, this is a weak set. Okay. So, so what we want to do is, we want to ask ourselves, what's going to be the probability of someone being a hegemon in this network? And what I want to do is to simplify matters, I'm going to take the gamma to be very large. Okay. And that will give us this picture, uh, this table. Uh, so I would like you to look at the last column um, just to focus our idea, minds on that. And what do we see? We see that all the weak uh, rulers, okay, essentially have a negligible, they have a zero probability of being hegemon. Interestingly, the strong rulers, uh, even though they have very different resource levels, right, some of them have eight units, some of them have 36, they have almost the same probability of being the hegemon. Okay, so this is a setting where the unequal resources are neutralized by the network. Okay, so let's now, let me take um, another example, okay, of a network like this, where the resources are actually very equal. Okay, so if you, if you look at this picture, you will see that if you stare at it for two, you know, two minutes, you will see that the two red uh, nodes are the strong rulers, and all the others are weak rulers because there's no way they can have a strong sequence. And the two strong rulers have very similar uh, resources, if you like, okay? Uh, nevertheless, if I were to take gamma to be very large and I allowed the number of um, nodes here, which are, uh, you know, linked to just 10, um, to grow, then, you know, what's gonna happen here is so let me walk you through the proof. What will happen if this, um, the spokes here uh, get very large is that I will almost certainly pick one of the spokes to be you know, the ruler who's active. Um, they will fight. This is in a setting of theorem one, so you always want to fight. So they will fight this Mr. 10, and they will lose almost surely because gamma is very large. And, and as a result, over time, um, the, this node will become even stronger, richer, and once it goes beyond um, 11, then this node is no longer, uh, does not have a strong sequence, and therefore the probability of this node becoming the hegemon will essentially go to zero. So that tells us that uh, this is a setting with equal, roughly equal resources, um, and um, as n gets large, the number of spokes gets large, the probability node one becomes the hegemon goes to one. Uh, so this is a setting where the network uh, completely, uh, decisively shapes the uh, probabilities of becoming hegemon and two relatively equal kingdoms might have very different probabilities of being the hegemon. So, so this is a, these are examples to illustrate the role of, of the network in determining who's going to be the hegemon. Um, okay, so I think one of someone in the audience asked me what happens when networks change, and this proposition um, gives us a first feel of how, as you change the network, what happens to the probability of becoming the hegemon. And uh, essentially what's happening is if you connect two nodes within a weak set, there is no effect. If you connect nodes in a weak set to a node outside, that increases the strong number of strong rulers. And if strong rulers uh, are linked, of course, that doesn't make any difference to their strength. Um, they still remain strong. Um, and so here's an illustration of what happens. Remember, this is the original network. I link a strong and a weak ruler, and that makes the weak ruler strong. It gives the weak ruler a root out of this terrible neighborhood uh, and gives him access to these poorer rulers, and then he can become, he becomes, he has a strong sequence. Um, here's an example of connecting two weak rulers, and that makes Mr. Six a strong ruler. Um, and finally, I'm connecting two strong rulers, and that doesn't change the uh, partition into strong and weak rulers. It may, of course, alter the probability of becoming the hegemon. Uh, but it doesn't change the partition into strong and weak rulers. Okay, 
So, um, so let me just say, um, move on to the model of costs of war. So this is a, the simplest way of thinking about um, the cost of war. You have, um, you know, if you win, uh, you get x plus y, but now you don't get all of it. You lose delta, so the, the net, uh, you know, uh, the net sort of uh, payoff from war is x plus y times one minus delta. When delta is zero, you are back in the benchmark model. And when delta is one, there is complete loss, so you will never fight. So, so just to get an idea about what it does to the incentives to fight, you have uh, two rulers with resources x and y, and x is greater than y. We know that when gamma is greater than one, it's never profitable for the poor ruler to fight the rich ruler. And if there are costs to war, that, of course, makes it even less uh, attractive to fight. Okay. So the only thing that could happen is a rich ruler might fight, and so the inequality we should be looking at is this inequality. Okay. When gamma is less than one, it's never profitable for the rich ruler to fight, and you only want to look for, at the poor ruler's incentives. Okay, so I'm going to now focus on the rich ruler, and this picture gives you an idea, the first sort of impression of what happens, and really what, let's focus on, um, um, So this is delta, okay, that's the cost to war. Uh, this is gamma, that's the, um, uh, you know, this is the rich rewarding case, gamma is greater than one. And what you see here is, this is the ratio y by x, and I'm looking at the incentives of x to fight. Uh, uh, y, of course, never has any incentives to fight in this setting. So x has incentives to fight, and this picture essentially tells us that the incentives are non-monotonic. Okay, so what it says is that um, if, for instance, uh, y by x, um, you know, um, is, let's fix y by x here, uh, you, you see essentially that the, the delta that you need here, uh, when y is very small relative to x, x really doesn't want to fight because x is going to win, but he's going to lose quite a bit because of this delta, right? He's going to lose a bit, quite a bit of his own resources in fighting, and he's not going to gain a lot because y is very small. So you want delta to be very small. Likewise, when y is very close to x, then when y and x fight, the probability of winning is half. So for x to have an incentive to fight y, the cost to war must be very small. Otherwise, it isn't worth fighting. Okay, so that's the two ends, and it's only in the middle when y is smaller than x but not very small that x really wants to fight y. Okay, so that's the uh, big sort of idea here that when you have costs of war, you will have fights amongst unequals but not very unequal kingdoms. Um, so the interesting thing that you take from this uh, interesting insight from this model is really the final bit here uh, when the costs of fighting are intermediate. Clearly, when they are very large, there's no fight, there's peace, and when they are very small, then you're back in the theorem one setting. So really, it's in between in the intermediate case that interesting things happen. And here's a, a very nice sort of example of the kinds of phenomenon you can uh, get in this setting. So what's happening here is on the left, you have a network, which is a line, on the right, you have a network which is uh, essentially a circle. And the resources now are put outside the nodes. 10 and 9 are the resources of the two endpoints. And RB are the resources of the middle kingdom. And what this picture is illustrating is when gamma is large, when 10 fights 9, it's going to defeat 9 for sure. So on the right-hand side, you cannot have peace when gamma is large. But on the left-hand side, if RB is sufficiently small, 10 doesn't want to fight RB because he's going to lose too much of his own resources in defeating RB, uh, and therefore he will not be good enough, strong enough to defeat 9. Okay, so, so that's sort of the argument uh, which says that you will have peace in the setting 
but you can never have peace in this network. Um, and this is exactly what we have from the definition of a buffer state. This is a classic work on buffer states, Che and Ross. These are small countries in both area and population. They are adjacent to two large rival powers, and they are geographically located between these opposing powers. If there is a direct link between the two opposing powers, then 10 will attack 9, and you will not have peace. Okay, so there are many examples of uh, you know, buffer states, and I've given some here. Belgium between Germany and France, and Finland and U Ukraine between Russia and Western Europe. Um, okay, so I haven't talked about um, poor rewarding technology, but here are some remarks on poor uh, rewarding technology. Um, what happens when gamma is zero, just to fix ideas, is um, we get, so think of a complete network with three rulers and think of a situation where the, where the rulers have equal resources, you will get peace. Why will you get peace? Because any ruler who fights, um, who fights one of his neighbors um, will, if he wins, become a target for the remaining ruler. Uh, because of this gamma equal to zero. So I don't want to fight Ali because if I were to win, then I would then become uh, a target for the remaining guy uh, because I've become very rich. So I don't want to fight him. In fact, no one wants to fight. So you get peace with coexistence. But if Ali were very rich, then of course I want to fight him because it's just too much of a prize for me not to, to fight him. And even if I know that if I were to fight I would become rich, I would be attacked, I would still do it. So if resources are unequal, then you will have war and hegemony. So, so in other words, uh, and so the way you sustain peace in this setting is by the threat of imminent war right after you fight. So I don't fight because if I were to fight, there would be more fighting and I can't afford it. So that's how you sustain peace um, in this model with uh, um, poor rewarding technology. Okay. I think I'm basically done. Oops.